I invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 10. Psalm 10. This is where we'll be for the first part of our lesson. Psalm number 10. I appreciate so much the men who have led us in our services so far. Appreciate Lewis's fine job leading singing. A couple of songs on that lineup we don't sing very often or haven't sang very much before and really enjoyed hearing them, really enjoyed singing them as a congregation. Appreciate the men who led us on the table and on the contribution. Appreciate the prayers. It's been good so far. I'll try not to hinder our efforts to worship God tonight. It's been good. It's been good to be together today to spend the best day of the week together. Psalm 10, please. Verse 1. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. It doesn't take a whole lot of explanation to capture the essence of living in a sometimes wicked world. In fact, this is one of those early conversations you generally have to have with your children because bad people exist. And sometimes bad people do bad things. And sometimes bad people do bad things to good people. I was thinking about this and Job's situation came to mind. When Job's servants are out in the field with his livestock, what happens? Wicked people come in and ransack the place and take his possessions. Wicked people doing wicked things. I can remember still one of the conversations that I had to have with the girls when they started getting a little bit older in public school. They would come home and they would say, so-and-so did this on the playground. And I would have to explain to them, not everybody is your friend. And I hope this is not offensive, but I said sometimes people are butts. And that's just the way it is. The world is full of people who act that way. And they're going to do bad things to you. They're going to take advantage of you. And here you are in the middle of all of that, trying to be not wicked, trying to be good and godly and faithful to King Jesus. So how do we work through all of that? Well, I think actually Psalm 10 will help us. It actually goes with Psalm 9. And if you were to read Psalm 9, you would see a lot of the same terminology, a whole lot of the same flavors. But we'll just work out a Psalm 10 for now. Because I think this passage will help us. It'll help us understand the wicked and understand the outcome the wicked can expect. And then, my friends, it can help us see where we fit in all of this as we try to not be wicked. So let's work out of this passage, and I'm going to do you a favor. We're going to read the first half of this psalm, and then we'll read the second half when I'm ready. All right? So Psalm 1, or Psalm 10, beginning in verse 1. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above out of his sight. For as for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Well, let's unpack that for a moment and appreciate the wicked do wicked things. 
Now that may sound so simple in some respects, but, but folks, I think it's something that we need to really come to terms with. We need to appreciate this point. The wicked do wicked things. Why are we surprised when they do wicked things? Why are we surprised when they do wicked things to good people? Because that's what they are. They are wicked, doing wicked things. So look at verse 2. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Listen to that language. The wicked persecutes the poor, takes advantage of the poor. See, let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. You see this scheming, this nastiness, this plotting against the world. That's what wicked people do. In verse 3, the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. I want you to think about that concept, the wicked boasting, boasting of his desire. There is nothing that his heart wants that he says no to. That's what wicked people do. They see, they take. It's what they want, therefore they will do what they have to to get it. Folks, individual living like this has absolutely no room for God. I want you to think about that. Boasts of his heart's desire. Now, if you're thinking about the contrast, the good don't necessarily come into play in this passage. But the good come into play in a whole lot of other psalms. The good are meditating on the law of God, and in the word they meditate day and night. That's where his heart's desire is, but not the wicked. The wicked are pursuing the things they want. There is no room in your heart for God when all you can think about is wicked things. This seems so obvious, doesn't it? And yet that's exactly what the psalmist is describing here, folks. This is why he blesses the greedy. He renounces Yahweh. He avoids God because he has no room in his life for God. Verse 4, the wicked in his proud, count, a proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Folks, he rejects the idea of God. But what's fascinating about this is, look down just a few verses. Down in verse 11, he says in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Even down in verse 13, the wicked renounce God. He says in his heart, you will not require an account. You, you listen to that. In verse 4, he says, there's, there's no God, no, no thought to God. But in verses 11 and 13, he's giving some thought to God. I, I really appreciated one writer said, he is atheist in principle, but hardly convinced in practice. You know people like that? They live as if there is no God. They live as if there is no accountability to God, and yet at the same time, they're living a life of confusion living a life of complexity because they don't know what to think. Their patterns betray them. In verse 5, His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of His sight. Folks, that, that phrase, verse 5, His ways are always prospering, that's a cry many psalmists would make. In fact, the psalm of Asaph, Psalm 73, he decries a similar thing. Why do the wicked prosper? If God is good and God is just and God is fair, why do bad people make it at all in this world? You ever ask yourself that? The psalmist here is observing the fact the wicked, they seem like they've always got the stuff. They're always making it. They're always prospering. They're always succeeding. He says that God's judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. I really like that phrase, judgments are far above out of his sight. It's almost as if this fella is so focused on ground level things, living for temporality, living for here and now, that the thought of something bigger and better and greater than him has never occurred to him. Working through this passage with me, as you are right now, you're probably thinking of individuals you know that fit into this sort of description, don't you? The 
This is how the psalmist describes the wicked. Verse 6, he says in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. I really like that because you, you might recognize we sing some songs. VBS is coming up. And for the life of me, I can't remember if this is one of the ones we sing. But this is a pretty well-known uh, children's song. Uh, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. You notice that same language in this verse? It's the wicked saying. You hear how this is this almost this, this counterintuitive language. The wicked is saying, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Now here in a minute, we're going to get a response to that, okay? So just don't, just don't let that alone. Hang on to it. But that's what the wicked in his ignorance says. I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. Verse 7, even his mouth is full of ungodliness. He says in his cursing and his deceit is oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. You hear that language. This is everything bad and it's coming from the mouth of the wicked. That's what wicked people do. But he takes it one step further. In verse 8, he sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. So it's this imagery of this fella sitting around waiting for somebody that he can pounce on, he can take advantage of. Describe a lot of things in our world today. We're going to get there. That's what wicked people do. Wicked people sit around praying on the gullible, praying on the innocent, praying on the helpless. That's the word at the end of verse 8. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He sits around like a lion. Maybe you're thinking 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 right now. As a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Well, that's what the wicked do. They do just like Satan. They look around waiting in secret, ready to pounce, ready to pray, ready to take advantage of. And so, verse 10, he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. And then in his heart he says, God has forgotten. He hides his face, he will never see. If you're thinking through this, maybe, maybe the summary above would be somewhat helpful. An individual in verses 8 through 10 in his arrogance, in his desire to take advantage of the helpless, he lives as if there is no accountability. Now, I want you to think, folks, that, that describes a whole lot of situations in our world today. What do the rich and famous and powerful think about themselves? They're above the law. You see, if you've got enough money in the bank, if you've got enough politicians in your pocket, if you've got enough influences, then what? There is no accountability for you. And yet, as the wicked boast in such nonsense, what do the righteous understand? Oh, you are in for a rude awakening. See, that's what we get. So if you're thinking through this, this should be no surprise to us. The wicked do wicked things. They're lurking around every corner, persecuting the poor, devising wickedness, boasting in wickedness, praising wickedness, re rejecting God. They seem to prosper. They ignore God's law. They boast over their enemies. They, their mouth is full of bad. They seek violence. They seek ways to oppress. Anybody here surprised by that? That's what bad people do. But Maybe here's where we need to shift then just a little bit. Pick up the reading in verse 12, please. In verse 12. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. To do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. My friends, what that is, is God's response to wickedness. 
and what great comfort it should provide us. When the psalmist reaches this shift in the passage, take special note of some of the same phrases, some of the same terms being used with God. So maybe the first one that really jumps out to you is this concept of verse 2. This is back up earlier in the passage. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. We might rephrase that because when I say the word poor, what you think is people who don't have money. But maybe we should broaden that concept just a little bit to include those on low places in the social atmosphere. Because when you had low money in the old world, you also were a nobody. You were lowly, maybe I should use another term now, you were humble. You see what he does in verse 12? Do not forget the humble. My friends, this is a response that while the wicked devise these terrible ways to persecute the poor and to, and to hurt the, those small in stature, the innocent, the helpless, verse 8, down even in verse 10, what we have is a God who hears the helpless. We have a God who hears the humble. We have a God who helps the helpless. You want to see that reinforced a little bit? Look at verse 14. You've seen, you observed the trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless, same word, the helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Who was the fatherless in the ancient world? Those were the ones most subject to the wicked in the world. The orphans. Those who had no protector, who had no provider. And what the psalmist is telling us is, God is there to help them. God helps the helpless. The psalmist is reiterating this point, reminding us that God responds to wickedness. You're thinking through this passage with me then. You're going to see these things. That He helps the helpless. Folks, that we who are in trouble, we who are in many ways outnumbered and outgunned in the ungodliness of the world around us can take comfort and refuge in our God who helps the troubled. You are not alone in your stand against ungodliness in this world. Not only do you have a family that wants to help you, that wants to encourage you, that wants to strengthen you, you have a God who is described as the helper of the helpless. What marvelous comfort that should provide for us, folks. That's God. But maybe we should even go one step further in verse 15. Verse 15, the psalmist says to God, Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. God is the one who stops wickedness. God is the one who will eradicate evil. That's who God is. That's what God does. Folks, to have an almighty God, to have the creator and sustainer of life, to have a God as good as our God means we have an advocate who is on our side who will destroy evil. Last week, the girls and I were privileged to go over to the lectures at Southside. And my friend Bruce Reeves preached, I think it was Tuesday night. No, it was Monday night. Monday night. And Bruce has been here. Bruce is the, the Peyton Manning reject. And everybody goes, oh, I know which guy you're talking about now. He's only like seven and a half feet tall. I'm kidding, but he is way tall. Makes that look like a little bitty stick in front of him. But he preached a lesson on Monday night regarding suffering. One of the primary atheist positions is if God is all good, why does evil exist? It's a good question. Now, I'm not going to answer that whole question because that would take a separate lesson. But I will say this. To Bruce's point, 
Just because God hasn't eradicated evil yet doesn't mean He won't in the future. Folks, that's one of the promises of Scripture. That the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15. Folks, when God, when God wraps up everything, He's going to eradicate all evil, all wickedness. By the way, isn't that part of what we're looking at here? That God's response to the wicked is, your time's coming. So the psalmist here in this passage is telling us God will end all wickedness. Look at verse 16. This is part of what goes into that then. Verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. You see, God asserts his rule when he does, all people bow to him. You may be thinking, when will this happen? I think in some ways God has asserted His rule in the gospel. And that's why we see so many military phrases used in reference to the gospel. We see such terms and phrases as Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. That's part of the gospel asserting the reign of God. But This also ties in with what I said just a moment ago, that one of the final conclusive actions is when God asserts His final vindication of the godly. And His his reign is consumed. We go to Him. And we we, we reside with Him forever. All ungodliness will collapse. Verse 17 then. Lord, You have heard the desire of the humble. Same concept that's been used, folks the lowly, the humble, the helpless. He says, you have heard their desire. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of the earth may oppress no more. The helper of the helpless hears. I want you to think about this. Look at verse 6. This is what the wicked says in his heart. I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. He says in his heart in verse 11, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. And yet what God is actually doing is verse 17. He's hearing the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. I want you to think about that. You see what's happening in the passage, in the earlier part of the passage, the wicked are boasting in their arrogance and their wicked hearts. But the humble, God's working with their heart. You see that? Folks, we can sit back as the people of God and take great comfort in God's response to the wicked. Let me summarize that real quick. He remembers the lowly. While the arrogant says, the boastful says, the wicked says, he will not require an account, we know better. He will require an account. Because he sees and he observes and he repays and he helps the helpless. He eradicates wickedness. He reigns forever. And when he does, he ends the rule of all others. He hears the humble, he executes justice. And my friends, what God does is stops oppression. That's God's response to the wicked. Now, I want to take this maybe one step further, because I'm sure as we're reading through, especially what the wicked does, you're probably thinking of some modern stuff too. Kind of hard not to. So let's, let's jump forward just a little bit. I want to think about today's wicked and proud. And we're going to hit on, on a couple of issues, okay? And we're going to do this rather quickly. But I want you to think about this. Look at verse 2. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. The wicked sits in the lurking places of the villages, verse 8. In the secret places he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. Back up to verse 3. He boasts in his heart's desire. Folks, does that not describe a current predicament in our culture? What does the LGBTQ plus stuff do? Boasts. In their arrogance, 
boasts in their pride and the wicked things of their heart. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You start thinking about some of the agenda that comes out of that community. And I can describe it. You may be a little surprised at some of the terms. It's violence. Now, now I'm not talking about physical violence. I'm not saying that community is pushing physical violence on me, certainly. But I will tell you what they're doing to those young minds is violence. It is outright wickedness. It, it is a form of oppression. It is, it is pressure and social pressure. It is propaganda. That's what comes out of that movement. But maybe, maybe I want to jump just a little bit to the side here. We get so focused on the LGBTQ side of things... We don't think about the fact that, you know, one of the underwriting sins for the month of June is not just LGBTQ plus stuff, it's pride. We have grown so accustomed and so tolerant of pride that we don't even recognize it when it's a sin. I would argue then that this month, being Pride Month, is sinning on two fronts. Because we have the audacity to look at our God and say, neener, 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 boo, boo, you don't matter. That's exactly what LGBTQ plus does. And we have the audacity to look at the future generations and say, you better get in line or you're in trouble. One writer said, a proud person thinks they are the center of the universe, not God. Folks, let me tell you what Pride Month is about. It is about the arrogance of humanity wrapped up in sexual sin. The greater the pride, listen to me very carefully, the greater the pride, the smaller God gets. And the bigger we are in our own minds, maybe I'm thinking of Saul, the smaller God gets. What about the term abortion? What kind of sorts of things does that resonate with? Well, let me just jump back into our text. Look at verse 8 again. Look at verse 8. He sits in the lurking places of the villages and the secret places. He murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. What's terrible is some of these issues have become so political in nature, we don't, we don't even think about the moral issues going on. Because we can't get off of the whole political paradigm. Well, it's this issue, and it's that issue, and it's this political party, and it's that political party. Folks, it's sin. It's sin. It doesn't matter which party's promoting it. It's sin. It's ungodliness. And we need to have the courage to say such. Not necessarily on Facebook, please. Maybe not the best format for this. But folks, that, that same argument is certainly true of abortion. What does that movement push? Well, clearly violence, clearly oppression on the innocent, clearly harming the helpless. What's happening there? Propaganda. Get in line or get out. Folks, we need to appreciate that that, that same issue is fundamentally a wicked action. And then let me just throw in this evolutionary theory here. It was great Russ mentioned that this morning. But you know, you, you know where the first two issues come from? They come from the third issue. Wh why have we gotten to a place in our world where we accept LGBTQ plus stuff like it is all hunky-dory and everybody's good? Because we have adopted an idea that we all came from nothing and that there is no God who governs the universe. Why have we gotten to a place in our world where we can think murder, murdering a child in the womb is okay? Because we have adopted a slogan, we have adopted a theory that is no more than a theory, that says we came from nothing and there is no God, there is no ultimate judge, there is, oh, listen to this phrase, there is no God that will require an account. 
You see how these issues all relate? You see how they all interconnect? They're part of a secularized society where God is no longer ruling in the hearts of man. Folks, we need to come to terms with this. But maybe just as relevant, just as helpful, we need to see God's response. Because if we're going to really dig in here, that's what we've got to get. We know the wicked do wicked things, but folks, God responds to wickedness. Let me just shotgun this really quickly. How does God respond to LGBTQ+? Through a godly marriage. One of the most powerful evangelistic tools you have is a good, godly marriage. Why do I say that with such passion? Because you are supposed to love your wife like Christ so loved the church and gave himself for her. When people see the way you interact as husband and wife, they should see something they want to. If your marriage isn't doing that, you're actually you're hurting the cause. God answers in marriage. God answers in the structure and organization from the creation pattern. He made Adam and Eve. Super simple argument, isn't it? But folks, it is still relevant. How does he answer the abortion issue? The sanctity, the value, the image of life, just like Russ talked about this morning. Folks, that all comes from the creation pattern. We are made in the image of God. We are made to be like God. What a terrible tragedy to rip that life away. Why why, why is murder wrong? Because of that same issue, folks. It's taking a life made in the image and similitude of God. And then the evolutionary theory, and I just kind of summarize this. It's answered in the creation. Of course, I, I recognize that particular issue really could demand a whole lesson to itself. But folks, let me be very clear about this. God always responds. Now before... Before you get too comfortable here and you start thinking, yeah, those people. Let me be real front with you here. Go to Romans 3 with me. We're going to hit two New Testament passages because I want to drive this point home. Religious people have a bad habit of looking at abortion as the worst sin imaginable. Sin, sin, folks. Sometimes we have a bad habit of looking at the LGBTQ plus community and say, that's so abominable before God. It's sin, folks. So before we start throwing rocks, we need to be really, really clear about this. We were once wicked too. Romans 3 with me, please. You may be wondering why Romans 3. Well, let me just share with you why. Look at verse 14 whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Go back up to verse 10. Where where is that coming from? Look back up to verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. What's he decrying here? He's decrying that sin is a mankind problem. Mankind chose sin, and since the fall, mankind has continually chose sin. The verse we just jumped in the middle of, verse 14, comes from Psalm 10. Folks, jump down to verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Psalm 10, he's decrying the wicked. In Romans 3, Paul is making the point, everybody has been wicked. At some point, everybody chose sin over God. So before we throw rocks at society, we need to appreciate we're in this mess too. But then just as beautifully and just as powerfully as Psalm 10, God responds. Jump down to verse 27. Romans 3, verse 20. I'm sorry, Romans 3, verse 24. Excuse me, verse 24. This is right after that comment. So we've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to demonstrate His righteousness because of the passing over the sins that were previously committed through the forbearance of God to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. you hear that? Everybody's been wicked at some point, and yet what God does is answer that wickedness with the cross of His Son, Jesus Christ. God responds 
to wickedness. And he responds powerfully. And folks, he responds even painfully. Go to Acts 2 with me, please. Acts, the second chapter. One of the elements that the psalmist decries in Psalm 10 is the apparent victory of the wicked, the apparent success of the wicked. And yet, he also comes back and says how God reigns. This same theme is in the New Testament. Acts 2, Acts 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Think about that now. Is there not a greater moment in human history where it seems like the wicked have prospered? The very Son of God dead on a cross. The very Son of God thrown into a borrowed tomb in Judea. Wickedness has finally won. Not quite. God always responds. Verse 24. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. My friends, listen to me very carefully. God always responds. And he responds clearly. He responds forcefully. And he certainly responds victoriously. The wicked will have their day. The wicked will have their time. And yet, God always, always, always responds. The reality is, we live in a world where wicked people do wicked things. That's kind of always been the case. In the days of Noah, there was evil on the earth continually. Violence by the hands of humankind. What was God's response then? The flood. Wicked people do wicked things. God always responds. It may not be right now. It may be in judgment. But God always responds. I think, I think we can take a great deal of comfort in that. I think we can find a great deal of reassurance in that truth that God, God hears the humble. He sees he, he is concerned. He will address the wicked. And the righteous shall endure, if that's the word I want to use here, the eternal reign of God. Which do you want? Which do you have right now? Maybe something for you to think about. If you have a need of this congregation tonight, maybe you have lived a wicked life, a life of sin and rebellion before God. Don't think of it in temporal terms. Oh, I've just done wicked. No, no, no. Wickedness is living in sin. Any sin, all sin. If you've done that, you need to change, this is your chance. If you've done that before, have you come to Christ before, but you went back into this world, come back now before it's too late. We can assist you in some way tonight. We'd ask you to make it known now as we stand and as we sing.